All right, welcome everyone to our seventh weekly composer chat. Yeah, Chris, you can go ahead and take the lead. You've got some agenda topics. Uh, anyone have any, before we get into the agenda, anyone have any questions for Chris this week? All questions for anyone. It doesn't have to be me. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably not. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, how about we talk about if anyone wants to show anything off this week. So if you've done anything on your own site, um, if you want to show that. Any programming you've been doing, any development on your own site, or anything you want to talk about in general, now's the time to say before we start going off through the agenda items. I've got one thing, if nobody else has anything, uh -huh. doesn't sound like anyone's talking yet. Um, there's something in the news, sort of when Composer's validating your news entry, that I'm not sure if this is a bug or if I'm doing something wrong. Um, so mm -hmm. I normally keep WYSIWYG editing disabled on my site because I do just HTML for all of my posts. And if I mm -hmm. go and add in a post here, I'm just going to do it here so that I can describe it well. Um, so I'll type in an opening HTML bracket in the square brackets, but then I'm not going to put the closing HTML bracket, which is an error on my part. I should put the closing HTML. Sometimes I forget to do that. I'm going to click mm -hmm. Add News, and Composer catches it, um, and I'll mm -hmm. I'll share my screen. Although it'll be a little small, so Composer it's a catches green, it. It's green, actually. Huh? Oh no, it's okay. Okay. It was green printed for a bit, hmm. but it's fine now. Uh, so it says error has occurred. Tag HTML was not closed, and it gives me a chance to correct it here. However, okay. if I do go in and type the closing HTML bracket and click Proceed, it says you did not fill in all the forms correctly and I go oh. back and then it's reverted my change. Um, so then okay, I Okay, that's, that's doubly annoying. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, uh, that, that must be a bug and I'm gonna write that down okay. and I'm gonna take a look at that. Yeah, so I wasn't sure if there was some right. other field I was missing or if it was a bug. So WYSIWYG is off, uh, com code is now formed, doesn't submit and back button breaks um, for all motor film. Okay, cool. I'll have a look at that uh, this week, probably. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, agenda items. So, um, customizing inline editing in Composer was an agenda item. Um, but I only, I, I guess I can do this. This was um, for one of our users, Joe. And, oh, Joe is here. Uh, I see he said his uh, name. Um, can you guys Joe, hear me? I assume this is Joe. It must be Joe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I got my uh, my camera working here. I can see myself, but I guess you guys can't see me. Yeah, it says it's turned off the video to save bandwidth, which it seems to be doing to people quite a lot, so I think it must be quite sensitive. Do, do you know how to use the text chat? We can hear you now, but it'd be great if you learned how to use the text chat too. Uh, how do I get to that? So on the left, it's the fourth icon down. It kind of looks like a chat bubble. Okay, yeah, I got it. You open that and then you can just type some text in. Right. So just All type right. in. Cool. Okay. Um, so inline editing. So Joe was asking me about that. Um, and it is a feature that we have by default. Um, and it's part of the temp code framework too. Um, we deploy it by default for title editing of content. So if you, for example, went to a news article, you could I think it's like you can you can control click the title of the news article when you're viewing it, and you can edit it. And so that's case one, editing titles. And case two is editing details of a member. So if you go to your own member profile, or I think if you're admin to someone else's, you can control click certain fields and inline edit them. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can get that going. This is completely off the top of my head because this is not a feature people use a lot. So I'm just going to share my screen now to my test site. OK, and I'm going to go to my profile because we're talking about doing it for member profiles. And I'm going to see if I can do it from admin. Let me see here. Yeah, I can't see that working, actually. I might need to turn it on, actually, in the configuration. So let me have a look at the admin zone here. Yeah, there is an option. Bear with me. Okay, the option is off by default. Okay, and it's um, in okay. it's feature options. 
and it's under advanced at the bottom. Enable inline editing. Now I'm using a Mac, um, which means it's probably slightly different to a PC because um, we have slightly different hotkeys on a Mac. But basically it should be the same, it's just different hotkeys. So I, I, I can't off the top of my head. Hang on. Um, I still can't see it working actually. Honestly, this is not something I test a lot. So, oh, there we go. Yeah, we just opened up that for inline editing. So I can change that to 10. So I, what did I do exactly here? So if I hover the mouse, you can see a little dotted border. I'm not sure if you can see it. Let me see if I can zoom in. Um, okay, I'm zooming in. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's any more visible when I zoom in, but there is a, yeah, you can see that better. Yeah. Um, the dotted border around it. So I, I held down my Windows key and I clicked it. Oh, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, was it my Alt key? Got to work out exactly what key I did here. Maybe it's two keys. There we go. Yeah. I think the way it works is you have to hold down two of the, I think they're called accelerator keys. And I, in my case, I held down Alt and the Windows key, which on a Mac is actually mapped to the Apple key or the command key. And I clicked it, and then I can type and just press Enter to save. Um, again, I'm going off the top of my head here, but I will show you how this is implemented in temp code. OK, so I'm going to move my editor across. And it's the About template that drives this screen. And I was looking in here before. So there's, there's this directive, Fractional Editable. And I will just copy that into a new, a new editor tab. OK. And I am going to explain what each bit of this means. And I'm going to split it out a bit so you can see it a bit more clearly. OK. okay. So it's the fractional editable directive. It takes the first parameter is the raw value, um, which is um, there's a distinction between the displayed value and the raw value. So imagine something supports com code. The displayed value, which is value, is going to be rendered in HTML, but the raw value is going to be the actual com code, so the marker. So the, the director takes the raw value. It takes the name of the field parameter as it's saved. Let's just pretend this is field 5. So it takes field 5 as the parameter. And it takes a page link where the saving happens. Oh, I just got this slightly wrong. Um, I believe this is 0 or 1. Let's just say it's 1. I think if it's 0, it doesn't actually allow inline editing at all. And then we've got the displayed value here. So what it's doing is it's wrapping the displayed value. So you actually use it where you display the, the field. And if um, the user viewing didn't have access to save, it would just display the um, rendered field without any editor. Um, but all the parameters to the directive define how it can do the inline editing. So going through again quickly, it needs to know the raw value, the unprocessed value, it needs to know the field parameter for when it's saved, and it needs to know the page link of where it's saved, and it has to have one. I, I don't know if that's, that last parameter is even needed. Um, now I'm going to show how it's actually implemented in PHP. So it's, it's a little bit complicated with this page link, but basically it's the members module, whatever that is. I can just change that to site if it's in the site zone in my case. It's the view screen of the members module. We're editing for this member ID, but we can actually leave that out if we we're editing ourselves. I think you can actually, I think we could actually leave that out too. I think that's enough. Anyway, if we look at the code for saving settings, um, again, it's a little bit complicated for member profiles because the editing is actually integrated into the viewing um, because it's got the edit tabs. Um, so we have these hooks that define uh, for each edit tab how it's saved. It's, it's probably a bit better if I share this. So 
here's the profile and we've got all these tabs then we've got the edit tab and then the edit tab has sub tabs and the settings and the profile sub tabs they get saved via the hook code for settings okay um and there's lots of calls to fractional edit in here and this is true if um an inline editing is going on so inline editing in, in the code is actually called fractional editing because you're doing a fractional edit of the of the form essentially so when, when you're saving just a single field being changed you're doing like a fractional save and um i, I just try and find a better example to describe this okay so if you're doing a fractional edit then all the settings that would ever by, have always be read from the form, like theme, preview posts, auto monitor, contrib content. Um, I'm hearing some feedback. Uh, hang on. Yeah, that's coming from uh, yeah, Joe. Coming if you from... could check Joe. Um, I turned his yeah. volume down there so you can continue, Chris. But Joe, make sure you're using headphones and nothing's echoing through. Yeah, I just muted you, Joe, actually. That's uh, solved it. Um, so type in the chat, text chat if you, if you like um okay i'm really aware this is pretty complicated um okay so if you're doing a fractional editing rather than taking all these individual settings from the posted data from the edit form it will either set them to null which basically means it's not saving any changes or it'll set it to something like integer magic null which is something recognized by the database system as saying don't ch don't save a change to that field so the date of birth day is integer magic null. And that will actually go through in this in the database query. Um, it will be trying to change DOB day to integer magic null. But the database layer in the code is smart enough to know to kind of skip a save if, if it's set to that value. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a weird hack in a way. Um, but it's nice because we don't have to have separate code for saving all this inline editing. It goes through the same exact same editing pipeline as the form. It's just it's doing it in a partialized way, a fractionalized way. Let me see if I can find another example from the code to try and explain this better. It might be better if I show you from uh, a different module because the member saving is so complicated with all those sub tabs and all those individual settings. So I'm looking at the news module now. Okay, so, so this is a good example. So this is the edit code for the news module. You can imagine a fractional edit is being posted through to this, um, pointed there by the fractional edit directive. And it's reading in the news article, but it's defaulting the field. So the field's called post, and it's defaulting it to the value string magic nil. So if it hasn't actually been sent through post, it will put it as string magic nil. And then when it tries to save in the database, it will just omit saving that field. And it's pretty much the same for everything. So integer fields are integer magic nil. Uh, string fields are string magic now. Um, so that's from a programming point of view. If you're just using the inline editing for something that already implements it, you don't actually need to write any of this code. I just wanted to give some context to how it actually works. Um, so yeah, again, it's as long as you have a module that supports fractional editing, then you just need to give the correct parameters to the fractional editable symbol. Um, you know, I, I think I think I'm going to write a follow-up article to this where it's a bit clearer. I think I'll write a a little standalone page very quickly that uses fractional editable uh, on maybe one custom profile field, and I'll hard code in the parameters for that field so that I can just show in a in a clearer way because this really is kind of tied into a lot of different things the way I'm trying to show it now. So I, I will do that. Uh, that won't take me too long. So I'll do that within the next week. And I'll post it in the discussion topic for this chat. OK, so I, I realized that was incredibly complicated. Um, but fundamentally, it's not too complicated when you're just doing a standalone single editable field. OK, so let me turn my screen sharing off here. So the next item is OAuth login. OAuth login, that's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so last week, we were talking a bit about social networks. And we talked about different ways we might want to integrate social networks. So, um, for example, most people wanted to integrate, if anything, Facebook. OAuth login is login is something we want to do to improve the um, 
ability to log into your website using different social network logins. So we, we have a Facebook support add-on right now where you can log in with Facebook, but it uses other Facebook um, um, APIs to do that Facebook login, and we're relying on Facebook, Facebook's code. And it's very much tied to Facebook. But you, you might want people to be able to log in using, for example, Yahoo login or a Twitter login or um, a YouTube login. Uh, and um, in the in the future, I just want Composer to be able to support multiple logins using a standard framework, and you just decide which ones you want to allow users to log in from. Uh, it's a little bit fraught this because um, historically there there have been various vendors who've tried who's tried who have tried to make um, standards for allowing you to log into websites. So um, there was something called Open ID, and you could log in using a like, Yahoo account and so on using Open ID. But basically, it was never really adopted on the internet. Um, but lots of websites now have are off login. And I don't want to get too technical. I just wanted to talk to people about what kind of, uh, what, what websites would you want people to be able to log into your website using? So would you want people to be able to log in using Facebook? Would you want people to be able to log in using YouTube? And if we could just go, go around everyone and ask um, uh, what particular websites you'd like people to be able to log in with. So shall we start with you, Jacob? Sure. Um, yeah, YouTube uses Google for login anyway, and most people, if they're not using YouTube, they're using probably Gmail or Google Calendar or something else. So the ability to log in with a Google account would be very helpful, I would think. Yep. Cool. Anything else or just Google? Um, I mean, Facebook seems like it would be something a lot mm -hmm. of people have, but yeah, I, I don't know. For my target audience specifically, I feel like a lot of them might not have Facebook, but yeah. Okay, um, Jason, any feelings, thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, primarily uh, Google and Facebook. Yep. Okay, um, Joe, uh, because we had to mute you, if you want to say in the in the text chat, but otherwise, uh, Bob, any thoughts? I don't uh, plan on doing anything with any of those. So. Okay, I think for me, probably just Facebook. Um, oh, Twitter. Joe says Twitter. Yeah. Okay. The, the advantage is um, it allows people to uh, it allows you to get user accounts onto your site without people having to go to the full sign up form, um, which is an advantage to you. Okay. Cool. Um, that was just a quickie. I just wanted to gather a bit of information there from people. Okay. So, so the next thing on the list is admin gamification. So uh, does anyone know what gamification is? Would that be adding? Was the gamif yeah, I'm not sure if it's gamification or gamification. It's, it's probably gamification. Uh, so, sorry, Jacob, go on. Oh, well, when I, I was reading through this, I assume that is adding some sort of incentive to administrating your website to make it sort of a game. Uh, yeah, exa exactly. Yeah, so um, I think often people... Maybe they lose their initial a few enthusiasm for making a website if the learning curve is too high. And uh, gamification is when you try and make it a bit more addictive. So you give people rewards for when they um, configure their website. And it's something I think is really cool, but because it's, it's obviously not a kind of a critical thing, we haven't prioritized doing it. But I, I would really love to do do some work on that. And I'm thinking maybe doing some work on it on um, programming live streams in the future. So examples would be something like um, you have you have a certain number of admin points, if you like. Maybe it would just be regular points that your admin account has. And when you achieve certain targets, your points go up until you uh, max out what you can do. So it's kind of like I'm like a level one, and you can get to like level 10 when you finish doing everything. And you can see all the particular tasks laid out, which will allow you to get up the levels. So maybe if you um, post your first news article, you'd get some points, uh, which would help you to get to the next level. Um, and, and I just think it's fun. Uh, anything we can do to make, um, make things more enjoyable for people. Um, I think it's good for the community too, because it just draws in more people. So I was thinking if I could get other people's thoughts on that. Maybe it's not cool. Maybe I just uh, maybe, maybe I just like the idea myself, but other people would find it a bit weird. Or maybe people have some ideas about um, 
things you could do to get points in this gamification scheme, and maybe we could implement some of them. So, um, Jacob, how, how uh, could you um, say for yourself, then go through everyone? Uh, yeah, so I, I do like the idea of adding some sort of system that shows you what you're doing and what you've accomplished with your website. When you said just now, like making your first news post, giving you points, that kind of reminds me of when people on the Composer forums, I've seen people um, talking about how you shouldn't necessarily make your website use every single feature in Composer. You should start with what you need to do and then figure out how to use Composer for that. Um, that's just something I've seen other people recommend on the Composer forums. Um, so oh, I yeah. think if we were setting up some sort of system that's kind of pushing you to do every single little thing in Composer, that might get a little bit um, out of the scope of what some people might want. You know, if they set up a website for a blog, maybe they don't have a forum. Um, so I don't know how that would work if, if you are trying to get them to make a forum post for points. Yeah, I, I think we just have to make it customize the particular tasks based on what add-ons you actually have. So okay. if you've removed the news add-on, it just wouldn't have that task. That makes sense. Um, um, okay, yeah, I'd say if you go through everyone, Jacob. Yeah, um, Bob, what do you think about about that? Uh, no comment on it from here. Okay. Okay. Uh, Joe is welcome to type in the text chat. And uh, Jason, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think uh, it would be a good way to get some of the new people sort of acclimated to the whole running a website experience. Um, probably probably not something that I'd be looking at to use on my websites, but I can see where it would definitely be a good use for, especially the, the new people. All right. Uh, Joe says he's got some earbuds now, so we'll try unmeeting him and uh, I'll turn him back. I, I think, I think Joe's saying he thinks the feature, the, the gamification feature would help, not his earbuds. If I read what he said correctly, <laughs> Wait. Is, is that right, Joe? You're talking about the feature helping rather than oh, the earbuds okay. helping. <laughs> no, no, no. Just. Oh, okay. No, you guys are helping. Cool. Um, can you guys yeah. still be okay? Is, we, is we it can, still yeah. echoing? Yep. No, no yeah, the echo's gone. You're good. All right, perfect. Okay, I, I was also thinking about having an animated paper clip in the in the corner of your site. That's a joke. I don't know if everyone remembers Clippy from Microsoft <laughs> Office. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, there's a tracker issue for this. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, we can post on that. But when we start doing the programming streams again, I think maybe I'm just going to do a few weeks of just um, implementing, hopefully with, alongside other people, some of these um, gamification uh, tasks. I'll probably write a little framework for it, and then people can code up new tasks for the framework, if people are interested. We can, we can certainly see how it goes. Okay, so run build custom profile fields is the next item on the agenda. And there is a link to a tracker issue, which I'm just opening up here. Okay, okay, so this is another case of me wanting to get a bit of feedback from people. So um, in the past, and currently we have certain custom profile fields built into, well, not built into Composer, but uh, bundled with Composer when you install in, then you can remove them if you want. And there was a few reasons for this. One would be just because certain um, social networks or services are so common, uh, people would really want their members to be able to fill out links to those links to their profiles on those services, like uh, Skype, for example. You'd want people to be able to fill in their Skype username in their profile. The the other reason being that if you're importing a website. Uh, from another CMS, often those other CMSs will have data for those fields, so we want to be able to import that data cleanly, so we need to map it to something in Composer. And there'll be a third reason in the future that would be that um, we'd like to bundle icons for these um, profile fields, so we'd like to bundle Skype icons and Facebook icons and so on. Um, now, we don't want to bloat up the system, so we don't want you to have to I don't, we don't want it to be the case that when you install Composer, you have like 50 different custom profile fields that come with it, and you have Skype and Facebook and MySpace and all that stuff. But we probably want like three or four by default. And the ability to create other ones from the stock icons and stock metadata just with a, with a few clicks. So I just wanted to go through people and ask them, what's 
services they, they think um, composers should have bundled custom profile fields for. Not necessarily bundled and enabled at installation, but bundled and easily installable um, through a link in the admin zone. Um, so again, Jacob, do you want to go through people? Sure. Uh, okay, let's start with you. someone else this time. Who wants to? Let's, Bob, uh, what services do you think would be good to have in there? Maybe the Skype and Facebook would be the only ones that would be of personal interest to me. All right. Jason, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, Google, all the popular social networks. Google Plus, I think, right? Yeah, that will be uh, probably uh, my main one that I would be looking for. Mm -hmm. All right, Joe. Uh, pretty much what everybody else just said. Uh, I like what's already uh, what what already comes with the standard installation. Yeah. In addition to like a first name or location or anything like that, but I think that's uh, that's all well, I, I I feel is necessary. One of the problems with this traditionally is certain things have been very mainstream and then they've completely disappeared so yeah. i think within the last month i think a a l a l a o l instant messenger uh, aim um was discontinued i think mm -hmm. i think msn messenger was discontinued quite recently and yahoo messenger i think that's been discontinued I'm, I'm not entirely sure so a lot of these really uh standard ones are just completely ghosted right now um so i'd, I'd really like us to bundle like 30 but then you probably have zero at the point of installation and you'd go into the admin zone and you'd kind of check off which ones you want and you'd hit a button and it would create them all with bundle icons. Uh, I think that, that'd be the best way. And then the installer, when, uh, the, the um, importers, when it's importing a site and it finds a site has that data, it would just auto create that field and import that data through. Yeah, personally, um, I definitely think like GitHub is one that probably a lot of people who are making websites would like to have um, and some yeah. of the other ones on your list like Reddit, Stack Overflow, I think adding some of those would definitely make it more modern um, as opposed to like Skype and Jabber that is currently on the list. And Jabber is a protocol, but there's not really, does that even, well, I, that's already um, in there. So I, does that even make well, sense to have that though? Unless it's like IRC uh, where you tend to use the same username everywhere? Yeah, let me correct you slightly. Uh, XMPP is the protocol and Jabber right. is the commercial implementation of that protocol. So there is a Jabber client, at least. Uh, uh, assuming it hasn't been discontinued, I, I haven't really checked. Um, so there is an official Jabber client. Um, I guess each SMPP network would have their own um, way of viewing a profile. Um, I think Jabber, Jabber is just the main XMPP network. OK. Um, yeah, that's the end of the agenda, actually. <laughs> We've got through that quite quickly in half an hour. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull up some more agenda items here from my list. Um, but if anyone has any any questions or suggestions or things to talk about, that's great, and we can talk about them. Does anyone use um, profiles a whole lot on their websites? Anyone here? I know Joe does. Elaborate a little bit on that. Um, do you utilize like the member profile viewing page where you make it easy for people to find that and I it seemed kind of cramped and didn't have it wasn't very visually pleasing when I started out with the default composer installation on my website I tried to I made some fonts a bit bigger increase some spacing um, but it still seems like when you look at other websites um, that aren't made using composer the profile page tends to be I can't quite put my finger on what it is that makes the composer one not exactly like other ones that was why i was asking uh you utilize that joe uh not specifically the um i guess what i'm trying to say is uh, i'm just starting off my website so i don't really have much of a member base right now yeah um but i would imagine that i don't have really many people or in the future i wouldn't really have many people that would actually utilize the the member screen itself fractional editing thing if I can get that working then I wouldn't need people to go to this specific page per se but um, 
Maybe it's the tabs. I, I think the, the whole tab idea is kind of weird. It would be cool if they were customizable. I guess that's another another topic, but... Yeah, Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to find... Uh, there's a redesign that's been done for version 11. I'm, I'm trying to find the screenshot from that. I think I found it. Yeah, okay, I'm going to uh, paste that link into the text chats. Um, so there's a tracker issue, and you can see the redesign. It looks a bit better, but it's probably not radically different. Oh, it definitely looks more modern, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I, I can talk a bit about profiles. Um, certainly, it's a very popular request to make um, well, various improvements to the member profiles. So commonly, people want users to be able to edit their profile page, um, edit the styles on there, so change colors and so on which I guess would be a little bit like MySpace. And I, I know certain CMSs are like to do that. It's it's typically the um, the social network orientated CMSs. Um, I'm a bit hesitant to, to bundle anything that in the default code because I think the vast majority of websites aren't going to want user editable profiles in that way. It seems quite specific. So I think it would be a really good area for a an unbundled add-on if someone wanted to do one of those. Um, but um, Joe and I have been talking about being able to configure the tabs better, and other users have definitely talked about making the editing tabs more customizable. Um, it's kind of weird that there's certain things on the the profile editing sub tab that's more like a setting, because because everything that's implemented as a custom profile field is on the profile editing sub tab, even if it's a setting. Um, so there's talk about moving some stuff to different subtabs, for example. Um, but Joe was talking about um, making it so you can add new tabs, for example. I don't know if you want to talk about that a bit, Joe. Uh, I mean, I think it would be kind of cool to separate some of the custom profile fields that you're making. So, for example, I utilize the custom profile fields quite a bit to populate a custom web page for members. So basically the page uses a bunch of temp code and it pulls values from the user's profile, you know, such as like a background image or what have you. Um, so I mean I, I utilize the custom profile fields quite a bit and I think that, I mean, yeah, I guess that's all I'm trying to say is it would be cool to just, uh, you know, be able to categorize, categorize those uh, custom profile fields. So, like, for, for, for what I use um, the custom profile fields for, for example, like choosing a, a background image or, or something like that, I'd, I'd like to be able to put that in my own tab, like maybe like a, a tab called website, something like that. So a user can click on that tab and be able to choose specifics, like, like a background image or what have you. Um, I had one question, though. Let me see if I can get to my profile page. Whilst Joe's looking at that, I'll just talk about that a bit. So I think that's a really good middle ground between um, uh, on, on, so, so some people want us to make it so it's the, edit, the profiles are editable, the, the profile layouts and color schemes, et cetera, are editable by users out of the box, um, which I think is too much by default. I think that would be bloated for most people. But having more of a framework for the, how the tabs work would help people build that themselves if they wanted that. And it would probably be useful for quite a lot of different things. So let's say a site had, um, we were talking about um, deals for social network uh, links. If someone had 20 social network links, it would make sense for them to have that on a separate tab of social network links rather than having a bloated profile sub-tab. Um, so I, I really like solving things from a framework approach and letting people take that take that in any direction they want to take it in. But I, again, if anyone wants to make an unbundled add-on, that's great too. You know, there's many ways to solve these things for the community. So Chris, I had a, a question here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a bug or if it's just uh, the fact that, like, clicking on the tabs utilizes JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, 
But basically, when I try to link to a specific tab, like if I'm on a certain page within a certain zone, and I mm -hmm. link to a specific tab to try and edit something under that tab, mm -hmm. it doesn't always go to that tab. So it, it, right. it's, it can sometimes default to the settings tab, even though I'm linking to like the notifications tab or the title tab or something like that. Yeah, I'm pretty I, I, sure that it used to work though. I could be wrong, but again, I do believe you. Uh, it's probably some kind of timing bug. I'll take a look at that. Um, okay. I'll just write that down. Um, uh, I could have sworn that it used to work, and I think, and again, I could be wrong, but I think that it started to not work mm -hmm. after we discussed a uh, recent bug fix. I think it was. Uh, yeah. Something to do with, uh, um, yeah, it was the Facebook issue uh, with Facebook logins, not being able to edit the profile. And I think right. ever since you gave me that, that update, um, it, it made it so it doesn't work. So I can't link, link to a specific tab. Okay. Um, I don't know about that update. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I always get surprised by what um, bugs uh, come out from changes. Um, but I know it's very complicated, the code, to get to the sub-tabs, because it has to direct to the edit tab. It has to wait for the Ajax request for editing to come through. Then it has to then navigate to the correct sub-tab. So it's very likely there's some kind of timing issue there, which okay. is making some assumption about the order things load in, for example. Um, so I will take a look at that, see if I can track that one down. Um, so I was looking at. Uh, possible things to discuss. Um, by the way, in the future, um, it might be we can start doing testing for version 11 in community chats. Okay. We can do user experience testing and uh, reviewing each screen, seeing if it's user friendly, seeing if people have ideas for that screen. In the, in the past, we've done that internally as a team, and um, I've always gone in thinking things are pretty good and then come out with like 20 things to change on every screen. So it's, it's a really useful process to go through that. Plus, it would give people a chance to see version 11 a bit early and for us to find any bugs and get them fixed before making a public beta. Um, there's one thing I've got down here that we can talk about, which is other CMSs, people's experiences with other CMSs, um, what they like about other systems, for example. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts, I, I, I don't really want to criticize other systems. I, I'd just like to know what other systems do well. Because um, I'm sure other systems, I, well, I know other systems do certain things better than Composer does. Um, so if anyone has any views on that. Um, I was recently playing with, um, I think it was Blogger, and I quite liked how uh, simple it was to back up your Blogger profile and to make simple, simple um, setting changes and to lay out widgets. Um, so people might have experience with other systems, be it blog systems, website builders, full, full on CMSs, even something like Facebook. And we might come up, come up with some ideas about how we can improve things and compose from this. So if anyone wants to chime in. No? <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, uh -huh. before the current version of my website, the last version was using Drupal. Um, mm -hmm. and that's where I got actually the design for the header that's on my website that I put in. That's kind of more like the default Drupal header, um, that's currently on mm -hmm. my composer site. Um, <laughs> I did like how easy it was in Drupal to add pages and to add news things. Um, although I, the thing I like that Composer does better is Drupal. I had to have add-ons for just about everything, like the forums and chat room, and um, you know that's just how they do things over there. Composer, I like how it's built in. Um, but yeah, I think Drupal nails the front end defaults uh, pretty well. Could you talk a bit more about that? So you said how easy it is to add pages. I'm not particularly familiar with Drupal. I okay. have just converted a site that was built in Drupal to Composer. So I've got some vague idea about views and fields and so on and nodes, but I, it's not really formulated in my head about how someone would, would, would build a Drupal site. So if yeah. you want to talk a bit about that, that would um, be useful. Well, it's been a little while. It's been about a year and a half uh, since I 
switched mm-hmm. over to my composer site. But um, the reason why composer is more complicated is because it's got, I think it boils down to zones and extra things like that. Whereas oh. Drupal doesn't have that kind of thing. It's an extra layer um, with composer. You're worrying about what zones all your pages, which I understand mm-hmm. the system that we've got with composer. It's just an extra thing that uh, Drupal... Uh, that's a- yeah, adding pages. That's, that's interesting, yeah. Everything was kind I of mean, root level on Drupal. So, um, Blue Sky thinking again. Um, are, are you? I remember I used that term before. Do, do you know what I mean, Jacob? Because it's kind of a term from the 80s. <laughs> um, I imagine that would mean just in a perfect world, not thinking about yeah. any limitations. Just I, I, Exactly. So, in a perfect world, uh, you have your site and you don't have a single customer zone on there. You've just got, under the hood, you've got the admin zone, the CMS zone, the site zone or welcome zone, whatever you want to call it, and the forum zone. But you haven't added any new custom zones. And what if you add a page and it doesn't even mention zones? Like the, the zone column from the uh, list of Comcode pages wouldn't be there. It wouldn't talk about zones when you're defining the page link, the new page. Would that make things significantly easier? It might make it easier in the short term. Um, I think it might confuse people, though, as they learn Composer, if they're not aware that of the zone system that's there. Mm. Um, yeah, that's always the trade-off, but I think sometimes the trade-off can kind of be uh, avoided a bit, especially if the average user isn't ever going to use zones, at least not in a configurable way. What if uh, there was a setting in the configuration, enable custom zones, and if that setting wasn't enabled, it just didn't show the zone editor, editor well, it didn't show the, the the screen for editing zones or adding zones and so on. Because I, I really think the average user, or even like 19 out of 20 users, are, are never even going to want to add a custom zone or edit a, mm. a pre existing I mean, the zone. reason I use the custom zones is because I've got one page on my site that I don't want sidebars on. So I had to add an entire zone just for one page so that I can not have panels oh. without doing any hacky JavaScript stuff um, to hide oh, the Oh, there's page. actually. Is yeah. There a um, to do that? There is. I, I think I emailed it before, but it's. Um, I'll just type it in the text chat. So you do. Uh, go with me. Oh, you're talking about the URL parameter? But the match key thing. Um, will this show through on the um, YouTube video? Yes. If I put this in the text chat. Yeah. Cool. Bear with me. Another thing about the zones, um, if. All right, let's see. So start if. If you're not getting a match on the example page link, then everything where dot, dot, dot is will show. So you just kind of put that code around the panel. And then the panel will be blank for the case of example, the example page link matching. I it's see. just kind of like a filter, a content filter. Right. I and I use I'm... that. OK, yeah. Mm-hmm. I use it a lot because it is very common to have pages without panels or pages. Often I'll just change what's on the panels based on the page links because um, often, often people have designs where maybe 90% of the pages have a certain panel, but maybe 5% have no panel and 5% have a different panel. And I don't really want to create zones, which kind of implies changes to the URL structure too and permissions. I just want to change the panel. So it's really handy. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the URL structure, I just added a page just to test, and by default, it got put under slash start slash page name. Um, if the user has not created any custom zones and they're not, they're only using one zone, is it going to show up under start by default still, or is it going to show up as a root? Okay, so start there isn't referring to the zone. It's it's because you've added a child oh, okay. page as a start page. Oh, I see. So that's the URL moniker. The default URL moniker will subsume the URL moniker of the page as a child of. But you can change that. So that that's a different thing entirely. Right. So for the welcome zone, if they add a page, or is it the site zone? That if you add a page, then that's not a child of anything. It's just going to be your domain slash the page name? Uh, that depends on if the single public zone option is on. So okay. let's just put that single public zone option to one side and talk about the welcome zone. So the welcome zone is at the roots. And yeah, it would just be slash page name. If, if you've got a URL scheme enabled, 
Um, if you don't have URL schemes, it would be like a, a slash index dot php question mark page equals and the page name. Uh, okay, so I'm just writing this down. Zones by default. Okay, so yeah, zones definitely complicate things for people. Over, over the years, we've gone through this process of having all this framework that confuses people and then hiding it by default. So if we can do that for zones, that I'm sure would simplify things for people. For people. Uh, people shouldn't need to know about concepts they're not even really going to need to uh, interact with. Um, okay, so any anyone else used any of a vaguely CMS-like systems? And again, it can be anything. It can be social networks. Um, it could be if you've uh, seen some amazing feature on MySpace on your MySpace profile, <laughs> and you, you want that in Composer. Uh, I'm kind of joking, but uh, you can get inspiration from the strangest places. Okay, um, so let's see what else we can talk about here. So this is sort of relating to zones, um, mm -hmm. but that's also relating to user profiles, which we were talking about earlier. So one of the things that I pinpointed, one of the things that kind of bugs me about the way that user profiles work in Composer, um, and I understand why it's this way, but when user blogs are enabled and somebody goes to add a blog post, they mm -hmm. get yeah. taken to the CMS zone. Um, now, I think of my website as having two sections. I've got the section that people see and then the section that only I see, um, which in my mind is the regular, I, I, my terminology is probably all kinds of messed up, but the regular zone and then the admin zone. Um, and I kind of think of the CMS zone as lumped in with the admin zone because I don't want people seeing my CMS zone because I haven't <laughs> themed it at all like I've you know, got my theme that I've put a lot of work in for the rest of my website that doesn't apply to the admin zone or the CMS zone. Um, mm -hmm. So when you go to a user profile, you can click through their profile page, their activity page, friends page, inbox, and everything is in the regular theme that the rest of the website will be in. But if somebody goes and tries to add a blog post, at least on my website, you go into the CMS zone, which looks different once you start customizing your website's theme. Um, okay, so let's solve this problem for you right away. So I'm, I'm sharing my screen here. Okay. And I'm on my profile and I'm on my blog tab and I'm clicking add blog post. And just as Jacob describes, it takes me to the CMS zone. Mm -hmm. However, um, things are coded pretty flexibly. So I'm going to open the redirects page and the structure, structure redirects. And I'm going to set up a redirect from zone content management. On page CMS underscore blogs. To zone, welcome to page CMS underscore blogs. Okay. So that is saying if you go to CMS blogs in the CMS zone, it's going to take you to CMS blogs in the welcome zone, which doesn't actually exist, but I'm going to get to that in a sec. So I'm saving that. Now I'm going to create a redirect from welcome zone CMS blogs to Project Management Zone, CMS Blogs, and I'm making that transparent. What this has effectively meant is that now there's like a virtual module running in the welcome zone called CMS Blogs, which is redirecting to the real instance of that in the CMS zone. And it's doing it transparently, so it's happening behind the scenes. It just appears to run from the welcome zone. Um, and I'm saying if you try and access the original module from the CMS zone, it will do an actual redirect to take you to the welcome zone. So now, if I go back and refresh, fingers crossed, if this is all hooked up properly, if I click Add Blog Post, uh, I don't think that actually has that worked. Yep. Yes, that's worked. Yeah. Wow. There we go. All right. Yeah. So when we define links between modules, we uh, basically make it search for the module, and the search function within the framework respects redirects. It looks at the redirects. And it will then kind of work out what's the correct zone to link to. All right. That is very helpful. Um, do you think maybe I know how to do it now, so this isn't a request for me, but something to think about is do you think people who are setting up user blogs would want their users getting into the CMS zone? And maybe do we want that to be an option or something? But hmm. yeah, um, just a thought. this is one of these. This is one of these classic issues with Composer where we're, we're making a bit of a framework that satisfies different kinds of user, because mm -hmm. it's meant to be really flexible, so you can make pretty much any kind of site using it. So 
So m many sites you'd have users contribute contribute contributing content. So they might be contributing downloads, contributing news articles, contributing gallery images. And you might want that to be going through like a, a CMS zone where it's uh, where you can kind of see all your content there. Um, or you might have a site where you have a staff team and the staff team have access to the CMS zone but not the admin zone. And you, you kind of use the CMS zone as, in a sense, their own limited admin zone. Or you might have the case of um, a site where people aren't even allowed to contribute anything except forum content, so they'd never end up in any CMS modules. Or you might have a case like Jacob where you want certain things to be submitted by users um, but you don't want it to be separate to open the website. Um, there's also some complexity with security. So the CMS zone is, um, by, default, it's, by default, it's configured to make you have to log in if you're restoring an existing session using your cookies. So for, for the public zones, if you access it another day, if you close the website and you've reopened it and you've logged in automatically using cookies, you can just keep using your login. It doesn't make you log in again. But for the CMS zone, it uh, makes you actually um, validate it. Validate your, your um, login just in case um, someone's trying to remotely control your browser to get it to do things. So there's an added layer of security. All that said, so saying that it really depends on the on the particular website and the different concerns we have. Um, may, maybe it would be a good idea to have some way of just saying these modules are going to run in the welcome zone and you don't have to worry about setting redirects. Maybe it could be... I just sorry, sorry, it, go on, it never would have occurred to me to set up a redirect from one thing to another and then back from that thing back to the first thing. Just Inherently, that seems like something you wouldn't want to do um, without somebody yeah. sitting down and explaining why that's a good idea and not a bad idea. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, these, these kind of decisions are a little bit tough because we don't want to add complexity whilst trying to remove complexity. Yeah. Um, so by adding a secondary interface and then having that manage an underlying interface, um, we're adding another layer of complexity and another UI. Mm -hmm. mm. I think I need to have a think about this. I, I don't think I can answer right away. But I'm going to write down to have a yeah, little think about it. I am curious now, um, if a user goes to add a blog post and they're in that state where they need their login validated normally, is it going to validate now that we've set those up still or is it not going to validate anymore? Uh, it will use settings for the zone it's running in. So because it's now running in the welcome zone, it won't require validation of your login. Okay. Because that that runs on a per zone level. Um, it shouldn't really be an issue actually, because we have um, request token tracking in Composer 10, so you can't remote control the browser at all. Plus, we also have um, referral tracking. So if if a form post comes through from some dodgy third party site. We will at least we will at least try and notice that and block the submission. That's slightly complicated by the fact that H well, it's not slightly; it's totally complicated by the fact that HTTPS will block referrers. At least I think it will. It, the rules regarding this are a little confusing, but uh, I, I think if an HTTPS site is linking to maybe an HTTP site, then the referrer is unknown to the HTTP site. So if you're running your site on HTTP and the hacker is running on HTTPS, I don't think you can detect that the request has come from that HTTPS site. Anyway, that is a complete tangent. <laughs> it's just something we think about. Uh, in version 11, I believe um, con uh, CSP policy will also add some protection, some extra protection. Uh, anyway, I, I don't think you need to worry about that. At yeah, all no, I wasn't concerned about yeah. it. I was just curious. Yeah, I, I think the um, post token uh, tracking will be enough. Okay. Um, yeah, I've kind of run out of things to talk about. Um, but that, that, that was some good stuff you had, Jacob. <laughs> if you've got any, anything more. Otherwise, Not I guess we'd close Anyone off the else have anything? Doesn't sound like it. 
Okay. Okay, so next week we're not going to do a chess, but we will do one the week after. So I'm just going to find out the date here just so it's completely clear. The next chat will be on the 13th of January. And um, it can't be this time because I'll be in England and that would be the middle of the night for me. Hang on, let me just do some quick math in my head. Uh, so I usually do it at 7 p.m. So that is 2 p.m. Central and um, 3 p.m. Eastern. Oh, that was different, Chris. Oh. Um, is it six hours different? It's usually six from CST. It's five from EST. Sorry. My, my wife is making points about time zones, but I think I'm right. So <laughs> 2, 2 p.m. Central time. I think I think that's the normal time, isn't it, Jacob? Two p.m. Central. Uh, I I don't remember if we did one or two. Let me see here. Okay, let's forget about Central. Let's um, I'll be a British imperialist, and we'll just talk about GMT. So we do seven p.m. GMT. One p.m. Central was what we had been doing. Oh, oh there we go. My my wife is correct. I'm wrong. I'm getting confused. <laughs> one p.m. Central. 7 p.m. GMT on the 13th of January. Is that good for everyone? If everyone who wants to attend? Works for me. Okay, bye, me. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, as I said, we're getting a bit low on uh, agenda topics, so we're probably going to uh, juggle the format around in some way. Um, I suspect we'll have a shorter live chat, like half an hour. And then a longer programming chat for anyone who wants to get into the programming. And I suspect we'll be doing um, uh, work on the, um, the gamification system. Um, but we've got two weeks to think about it now. So I will post the uh, topic on the forum as usual. And any, anyone who has any ideas uh, can chime in. And we'll decide what we're going to do. So thanks, everyone, for coming. And I hope to see uh, most of you in two weeks' time. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.